few motivational speakers in the world that are quite as famous as Tony Robbins, who rose to fame in the late 80s thanks to a series of infomercials that promoted his soon-to-be popular seminars and self-help books. Today, Tony owns more than 30 companies in a variety of different industries. Millions of people continue to seek out his self-transformation techniques, including rock stars, movie moguls, CEOs, presidents, and members of at least two royal families, as well as such inspiring personalities as Nelson Mandela and Mother Teresa. With a non-stop schedule like that, whenever Tony is looking to be reduced, re-energized and replenished, he knows exactly where to head. His main residence, a palatial mansion situated in Manalapan, Florida. Tony has called this part of Florida home ever since 2013, when he first purchased a two acre property with more than 16,000 square feet of space for an astounding $24.75 million, which at the time marked the second highest price tag ever paid for a home in the Palm Beach County area. For that obscene sum of money, Robin secured himself a home that spans all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the intercoastal waterway, but it wasn't exactly easy to find. Having never lived in Florida before, Robbins and his wife Sage spent six weeks looking at a hundred different properties across three different states. Then they found a freshly built one. Boasting six bedrooms as well as nine bathrooms, the opulence of this mansion is matched only by 172 feet of private ocean front it also comes with. Built like a traditional Georgian style estate, the home is said to include a massive master bedroom on the first floor, while the second floor houses media and club rooms. But the one part of the house that Tony has shown off the most is the epic front foyer with marble floors, gigantic ceilings, a curvy staircase, and enough room for one massive Christmas tree during the holidays. That being said, the most interesting addition to Tony's home is definitely the indoor slide that helps him get from his first floor to his basement playroom with its squash courts, golf and racing simulators, as well as its very own bowling alley as quickly as possible. As for the exterior, the home is said to have a resort-like feel thanks to its many palm trees and sand, not to mention a beachfront infinity edge pool. There's also a pair of two car garages, a newly built seawall, and a lakeside dock among his many amenities, including the ability to travel wherever he wants in a short amount of time. He told Palm Beach Illustrated, My wife has all the resources she wants. She could be shopping in 10 minutes, or she could go to Boca in 15 minutes. It's nice to go have Sprinkles ice cream or hop over to Nordstrom's. It's a beautiful area. And you've got everything you could imagine here. We really love it. For as much as he might have paid for this home 10 years ago, estimates suggest that it's worth far more today. And some experts believe Tony could ask for as much as $75 million if he were to put it up on the open market. Not that that appears to be happening anytime soon. After all, Tony's got choices, and if he ever feels like leaving Florida, then he can head to his favorite destination on the planet, Fiji. In 1989, at the age of just 29 years old, Tony Robbins bought himself a 525-acre all-inclusive resort known as Namali on Vanu Levu, Fiji's second largest island for $12.15 million. Today, that same resort is worth more than $50 million, and even Oprah once listed it as one of her favorite things back in 2012. Tony discovered Fiji years ago. At the time, he was sitting on one of its many beaches, watching the tide come in and looking at the stars, when he suddenly realized just how truly special it was here compared to most other places in modern day society. He told Architectural Digest, for me, quality of life changed when I went there. I shut off all the stimulus of CNN, the million phone calls. I went deeper. I was listening to the whispers of destiny. Ever since then, Tony has lived on the resort two months out of every year. But before I tell you about where Tony resides here, let's take a look at the resort itself a bit more first. Located about an hour's flight from Suva, the capital city on VT Lavu, and a short drive from that island's airport, where locals have to shoo away cows before a playing in land. This former coconut plantation was built on limestone and lava outcroppings over the Koru Sea. Anyone visiting this intimate resort is sure to find it as alluring and mesmerizing as the meke dance used by the Fijians to welcome all the resort's guests. Tony enlisted the help of Robert Trown, an Aspen, Colorado-based architect to design the Mole with the assistance of an Indian construction company as well as numerous islanders. 
Situated amongst lush vegetation, including giant ferns, as well as mango, coconut, and breadfruit trees, this resort has been built in what's known as Fijian Bore style, which features traditional thatched dwellings you'll find all over the islands. The reef 200 yards out provides excellent snorkeling, fishing, and diving, while the majority of the 16 Bores offers 700 degree views of the sea. They are linked by a series of wood decks leading to pathways that wind their way through some truly romantic dining spots hidden amongst the rocks. All of those huts were constructed by hand utilizing a team of 40 craftsmen whose only power tools were drills to use in the volcanic rock. In the main bore, the resort's central lobby, timber beams are wrapped with patterned coconut fiber rope known locally as Maji Maji. Then the roof has been thatched with a folded flat leaf referred to as soga. Taken as a whole, the entire resort creates a mesmerizing landscape and Trown once told AD, it seems to float above the cliff face. The banyan and guava trees help create the sense of total seclusion. Trown wanted to cultivate a Fijian feel but also wanted to avoid cliches. As such, he drew on the island's distinctive blend of cultures, mixing Fijian and Indonesian artifacts as well as rattan furniture to decorate many of the rooms, including the Beulah. As such, he drew on the island's distinctive blend of cultures, mixing Fijian and Indonesian artifacts as well as rattan furniture to decorate many of the rooms, including the Beulah house, a grand villa that boasts two adjoining guest quarters, walls paneled in wood, a pool, as well as private access to the beach. Meanwhile, the resort's open air dining spot features more of the traditional thatch roof construction, as well as a large deck that overlooks the ocean and smaller decks for intimate dining down within the lava rock crevices. Once everything was perfect, Tony opened this resort in 2003. It's been one of the island's most in-demand destinations ever since. Tony Robbins is famous for being able to get people to walk across hot coals. And no, I don't mean that just metaphorically speaking. But whenever he holds seminars here on his island resort, things are a bit more relaxed, especially for him. That's because Namale is the one place that Tony likes to come to unwind. As Tony himself likes to put it, it's the retreat to which he escapes to be with his family while also finding the time to climb in the rainforest, relax, write, and create. Tony does all of that from his own private residence on the resort known as Lo Malongi. The natural environment on the island is bright and full of color, so the palette inside of Tony's home, specifically in his master bedroom, is neutral to highlight his views. The interiors here are an exotic extension of the jungle outside, and Tony's living room is said to open right onto the pool deck. There are also little details like antique prayer pages hanging above a series of bookcases in this room. Of course, with this being his own private fortress of solitude, Tony has refrained from sharing much about his own personal living quarters. But ever since first purchasing this property in the late 80s, he's expanded the resort's overall size to what it is today, with an additional 300 acres. And he's done it all by keeping to his own laws of success. He told AD, I wanted a place where people could experience serenity and freedom and be nurtured. I brought my friends here and thought I don't have to say squat, I can just sit here and watch them transform. According to Tony, anyone visiting this magical destination and experiencing its tropical breezes will find themselves in due time. So if you got a few thousand dollars just burning a hole in your pocket and you're finally ready for a little self-growth, then the Namale Resort and Spa is calling your name. All right, everyone, that'll bring this house tour to a close. Thanks so much for watching. And before you head off, consider answering the following question. If you could own and operate your own resort anywhere on the planet, where would it be? Let me know where your personal Fiji is located in the comments below. Otherwise, like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to make sure you never miss an episode. My name is Kara. Don't go anywhere yet because coming up, I'm about to take you inside the homes of the late Jerry Springer. I'll see you all next time. Bye. Without a doubt, Jerry Springer was easily one of the most recognizable names in all of talk TV. I mean, after all, how many other hosts can you recall having their name chanted on a regular basis for minutes on end by their studio audience? Jerry might not have bribed his audiences by showering them in gifts like free books and new cars, but that didn't stop his series from briefly beating out even the Oprah Winfrey show in the late 90s as TV's most popular daytime show. The Jerry Springer show started life as a political commentary program back in 1991, but it would soon shift its focus to tabloid news in the mid 90s to turn itself into a ratings juggernaut. Over the next 27 years, Jerry would become the king of shock TV. And when 
whenever he needed to escape the madness of enraged ex-lovers, flying chairs, or other dangerous projectiles, Jerry made his way back home to his residence in Sarasota on Florida's Bird Key Island. For those who never heard of it before, Bird Key is a man-made island that was created back in the 1950s by founding father Arthur Vining Davis. Arthur was the CEO of Alcoa, the world's eighth largest producer of aluminum. Jerry's home on the island is located in the west, boasting a reported four bedrooms, five bathrooms, as well as just over 6,000 square feet of space. He purchased this very salmon-colored home back in 1987 for just $375,000. And since then, it's increased in value to an estimated worth of $4.6 million. Unfortunately, Jerry has maintained a wall of strict privacy when it comes to his home life and he's never shared any images of the inside. Instead, all we really know for sure are the amenities included around the property, like its full dock with a private boat. Even with all that water surrounding Jerry's home, he maintained a large swimming pool in the premises that took up the majority of the backyard. Meanwhile, there's also a gigantic deck that provides ample space to spread out under the Florida sun or to enjoy those wonderful views of the water. And while we might not know all that much about Jerry's home here in Sarasota, we know quite a bit more about about his love for the city. Jerry Springer decided to move his home base from Cincinnati, Ohio to Sarasota, Florida in 1997. Interestingly enough, Jerry almost didn't move to Sarasota at all. During a 2012 interview with The Observer, he revealed that Sarasota was actually his third choice of ideal living spots. But after determining that California would be too far of a commute and that South Carolina was simply too cold, Springer decided to set down roots in Florida. From that point on, he immediately fell in love with the state's sparkling shorelines. In fact, it was Jerry's ex-wife, Mickey Velton, that discovered Sarasota in the first place. At the time, he and Mickey had been looking to live on the water, so Mickey traveled to Florida and spent a day or two just driving around. When she arrived in Sarasota, she was captured by its beauty and picked out a series of 10 different houses. Shortly after, Jerry flew down to check them all out. The 10th and final house would turn out to be the one they both loved it so much, they decided it would become their primary residence. Soon after, the people of Sarasota began to take notice of their famous new neighbor, always maintain Jerry's privacy with the necessary level of respect. Sometimes when he and Vicky were enjoying a meal at St. Armand Circle Shopping District, there might be a tourist or two who wanted to take a picture. But for the most part, Jerry could be home in Sarasota and not have to worry about being bothered. Now you might be wondering, considering every episode of his series around this time was shot in the state of Connecticut, how did his home in Sarasota Sarasota become his primary address. Well, it definitely helps that Jerry owned his own private plane that he used each Sunday to commute to Connecticut. He then spent two days shooting an entire week's worth of episodes only to hop on his plane and fly back. For the rest of the week, Jerry would enjoy his time off by walking around Lido Beach while eating out at a ton of local restaurants, such as Cafe Amici or State Street. But as special as Jerry's relationship was with Sarasota, it wouldn't be where he spent his final few days on Earth. Those moments were reserved for Chicago, Illinois. During the second season of The Jerry Springer Show in 1992, the series moved from Cincinnati to Chicago. Jerry continued to live in Cincinnati, but would commute to Chicago daily to film the series. When the show first arrived in Chi-Town, it was still a political series conducting serious discussions with various panels, but that would soon change in a way that many citizens of Chicago didn't appreciate. Weighed down by low ratings, The Jerry Springer Show underwent a metamorphosis during this period, turning the series into a never-ending parade of individuals who belonged to hate groups, had strange fetishes, were being cheated on by their partners, or were simply brawling uncontrollably with family members. It was more like theater than it was a talk show, and it was also wildly successful, featuring such weird episode titles like I'm Pregnant by a Transsexual, I Slept with Your Husband and Son, Livid Lesbians, and My Grandpa is a him. But once the series has evolved into this new structure, mainstream Chicago figures became mortified that Springer was making a reputation for himself in their city. When Springer showed up on the cover of Rolling Stone, local reverend Michael Flager launched a protest against his show. Then in 1997, Channel 5 anchors Carol Marin and Ron Majors 
resigned over concerns about the direction of the news operation after Springer was hired to provide commentaries for the 10 p.m. time slots. Springer delivered two commentaries and then quit. Two years later, the Chicago City Council called Jerry for hearings to determine if his show could be required to get an entertainment license. Eventually, in 2009, the Jerry Springer Show deserted Chicago to film in Stamford, Connecticut. That's when Jerry began his decades-long commute from Florida to Connecticut each week. Somewhat surprisingly, Jerry announced his retirement from entertainment a few months ago in late 2022, stating at the time he wanted to try enjoying retirement while he was still healthy. He explained in a statement released to the media at the time, I'm 78 and have been in front of the camera now for 40 years, plus 10 years in politics. I'm winding down. In in particular, Jerry was looking forward to spending time with his 13-year-old grandson who lives in Chicago with Springer's daughter Katie and her husband Richard. With his daughter still living in Illinois, Jerry actually owned a home of his own in the state and while we know next to nothing about it, it would become the very spot where he spent his final few moments on this earth. Word came down on Thursday, April 27th that Jerry had passed away in the comfort of his Chicago home. Family spokesperson Gene Galvin would release a statement after his death, reading in parts, Jerry's ability to connect with people was at the heart of his success in everything he tried. Whether that was politics, broadcasting, or just joking with people on the street who wanted a photo or a word. He's irreplaceable and his loss hurts immensely, but memories of his intellect, heart, and humor will live on. So while Sarasota might have been where Jerry's heart was, Chicago will be where his body remains at least for the time being. It's unclear where he'll be buried, but it will no doubt be somewhere that came to mean a lot to him over the course of his life. For now, that'll bring this latest house tour to a close. Thanks so much for watching, and before you leave, consider answering the following question. Would you be willing to commute by flying to a different state each week for work? Let me know if you would have kept that up for decades like Jerry did in the comments below. Otherwise, like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to make sure you never miss an episode. My name's Kara, thanks again for watching, and and I'd like to send my best wishes out to Jerry's family. We're all thinking about you right now.